Every great champion knows that success, overcoming, and winning in life is no accident. Creating individual success is like having a recipe for a great meal. It only works if you know how to use the ingredients. As a best-selling author, entrepreneur, business coach, strategist, and champion, the Lewis Howard Live Show provides you the insider's view on winning. All we do is win, 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 helping you become the best version of yourself. Welcome to another live edition of Lewis Howard. I'm Lewis Howard. And as you know, our set's a little bit different, more of a conversation. And today I want to have a conversation with you about our democracy. I love history. I appreciate history because if it wasn't for history, we wouldn't have the present. And I know a lot of people are into not regarding history. Uh, They treat it as old school. But if it wasn't for old school, we wouldn't have new school. So just remember that we didn't just pop out of the planet and start today today. Today came out of history. So I want to share a little bit about the perspective of how I see and how I view our democracy. And before I start, let me say, I believe that our country and our nation, from a democratic constitution standpoint, is one of the greatest things on the planet. It's easy to look at Denmark. It's easy to look at Sweden. It's easy to look at Italy and say, why don't we do it like they do it? Why don't we do it like this country? But America is very distinct and very unique in its democracy. So I thought it was worth looking at a little bit of history and then, of course, pulling us forward. If you're a first time listener to it, welcome. We appreciate you joining us as always. You can always get our previous shows on the audio platforms and now we're available on YouTube. So we can get you anywhere and you can get us anywhere and connect to us and as well as going to Lewis Howard Live. Dot com. So let's talk a little bit about our democracy. America's democracy is defined as a political system, a system of decision making and an institution or an organization in a country. That's the definition as many dictionaries have put it. So that's what democracy is from a definitive standpoint. Historians say the democracy had its birthplace among the Romans. Remember those guys, you know, the Roman Empire back in the way day and the Greeks in the 18th century. I have friends that are Greeks, so they're going to love this conversation today. So shout out to all my Greek friends if you're listening in today. So democracy has its roots in both the Roman Empire and the Greeks Empire in the 18th century. It was France who formalized democracy, but America, the United States of America, when it became a nation, actually has perfected democracy. What do you know about democracy? So today is more like a civics walkthrough, a civics education, if you will, right? I'm not a civics teacher, and I don't think I did that well in civics, but I do appreciate history because history gives me a perspective on where I am in the present. So how do we get here? Right. How, what really created democracy? Well, you'd have to look at Thomas Jefferson because Thomas Jefferson created the first transfer of power as we know it today. We're in the middle of election season, right? Everyone's holding their breath about the transfer of power. Will the power be transferred peacefully or is there going to be trauma and drama? Well, when you look back in history, Thomas Jefferson, one of the architects of the Declaration of Independence, actually set up the transfer of power. So we're going to talk about that today in a little bit more detail. America has pioneered a successful democracy, very different than the violent upheavals of the French politics uh, and the corruption of the British model. There are multiple models of democracy, but again, America, I believe history says that we have did the best. In modern times, and talk about transfer of power, we saw recently George W. Bush, the 43rd president of the United States in 2008, transfer power to the first African-American president, Barack Hussein Obama, in 2008. 
that was a significant change of power because it was not only just a change in parties in leadership, but it was a change in culture and color. America was bringing into office its first African-American president. And if there was going to be a disruption in the change of power, it probably would have occurred at that stage. It was a tightly contested election, yet Barack Obama was declared the president-elect and ultimately the president of the United States. So that was an interesting moment in our history, and it is to be applauded. I don't believe that George W. Bush gets enough credit just because he's with a different party, but he should be applauded for handling that very professional, very class act to really usher in the leadership of our first American president. Now we have our current president, as I'm doing this show, Donald J. Trump, and we're in the middle of finding out, will he be required to transfer power to elect president-elect uh, Joseph Biden, as was elected by the media and needs to be confirmed by the state legislators and their electors. Okay, so everyone's holding their breath a little bit about what will that look like. But I believe that our democracy is stronger than any one person, any one race, any one group, any one culture. When you look at history, the amount of wars that we have fought and the things that we have gone through in our nation, in our history. I'm not talking about what's on social media Facebook and Instagram, that ain't history. That's pop culture for now. But you really should dust out those civics books, dust out those history books that you were so quick to get through in class. Maybe take another look at how strong America is. Uh, before we go to break, remember that America is hated. And it's not hated because it does bad things. It's hated because of its freedom. It's hated because we give people the right to vote. We give the right for people to have a say in an election. And many countries do not do that and they do not support that. Yeah, you can say a lot of different things that we've done over the years for America, but America really stands for the number one thing is it stands for freedom. Hey, this is Lewis Howard. Stay with me. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to further jump into the hypocrisy of our democracy. When you come back, you'll know why I've given the show this title. The Millionaire Club Charity is one of Seattle's oldest existing charities. In addition to job placement and employment services, the Millionaire Club provides job training and licensing to help workers become qualified and job ready, from nutritious meals and sack lunches to housing assistance to stabilize their lives. Despite its name, the donors to the Millionaire Club are ordinary citizens with a desire and passion to help fellow citizens overcome the barriers of employment and housing. For more information, call 206-728-JOBS or go to millionaireclub.org. Hey, this is Lewis Howard. We're talking about the hypocrisy in our democracy today, starting with sort of a history lesson on what is democracy and why is it so critical to America and how we live every day, being able to have the right to protest, being able to have the right to say what we feel on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, TikTok. You can sound off any place and we can take that for granted. But if you get outside of America, I heard Marvin Gaye, the late singer, say this one time. He says, sometimes you have to leave America to appreciate America. I think most people don't leave America. And sometimes you don't really have a context in living color of what other places are like when you go. I get to travel. And you really see the difference when you go to other countries in terms of how they treat their citizenry and how they treat you as an American. Very different. So as a homework assignment, you should travel. I know we're in the middle of COVID-19 and all that lockdown. So people are not necessarily doing the traveling thing. But when it opens up more, you should go travel because you'll find that America really does have a very special and distinctive feel. Sometimes when you live here so long, you take it for 
familiarity and familiarity breeds contempt. You don't know any different because you don't know any different because you don't travel. You haven't been outside your city. You haven't been outside your state. I know people that have never, ever left the United States of America. I know people have never left the city that they've been in, letting on the state. So sometimes to have a better perspective, you got to travel. You got to get out. So I want to encourage you. Go book a vacation to the Bermudas. Take your wife, take your girlfriend, take your partner somewhere around the world so you can get an experience of what America is. I heard this phrase, hypocrisy of democracy, years ago while listening to comedian Chris Rock, one of my favorite comedians. Love the guy's uh, perspective. And Chris Rock doing a stand-up show says, the term stuck with me about hypocrisy in our democracy. And I began to sort of see it through the lens of many uh, double standards that we sort of have when we talk about our democracy in the U.S. and our, around the world. What is hypocrisy? Well, hypocrisy is the practice of claiming to have moral standards or belief in which one's own behavior does not conform. So claiming to have a belief or a practice to which you don't conform. That means if you're a politician, you make laws that you don't follow. You're asking the citizenry to do things you don't do. The rich have advantages that they don't follow like the poor have to. So that is a hypocrisy in our democracy. And I think it makes people feel a certain way about our country when they see those hypocrisies, when they see one group of people benefiting from a protocol, a law or a procedure or a gender, when another group is harshly judged or put under strict condemnation about the same law. So that creates what we call the hypocrisy. And uh, so what is good for the goose is not always good for the gander when you talk about the hypocrisy of our democracy, which means that what's good for one person is not good for another person, right? One law does not benefit or everyone doesn't follow the same law. That creates an hypocrisy. So if we have a law, the person who made the law should also follow the law, just like the people that they are expecting to follow. We're seeing that right now in COVID-19. We're seeing policymakers, we're seeing leaders tell you to wear a mask, telling you to mask up, telling you not to go with friends and family, and yet they are seen on camera going to different places that they shouldn't be going. That's an hypocrisy in our democracy. So if you're just joining the conversation today, we're just kind of breaking down a little bit of our democracy, talking about some of the history, some of the inconsistencies, and really some of the good stuff, because there is good things in our democracy. And let us not forget that, because if you watch too much of the media, both liberal and conservative, all you hear is the negative and the bad, and you think that America doesn't anything good, and yet America does a lot of good. We're going to share a couple of things of what America does, but we need to talk about some of the things that, yeah, America doesn't do. I'm Lewis Howard, and I really appreciate you joining the conversation. And of course, to remind you, you can catch us in the audio version of our programs on Blog Talk Radio, YouTube, and so forth. And uh, at the end of the show, you'll see some logos and where you can click on and catch us. So let's talk about the justice system in our hypocrisy of our democracy, which is our conversation today. Our system of justice is represented by what's called lady justice. You know, you've seen the blind lady and the justice on the Supreme Court, and it is an allegorical personification of our moral force in the justice system. And in effect, that Lady justice is supposed to be blind, which means that justice is supposed to be blind. Sir Matthew Hale, an early historian of the law, wrote this. He says, it's better for five guilty persons should escape unpunished than one innocent person should die. That is the premise of what our justice system is supposed to look like. Our justice system says that there is a presumption of innocence. In other words, if you're charged with something, if you allege me with stealing some cupcakes from the store, I am presumed innocent until you prove I stole the cupcakes. That really is our system of justice. It is not 
I walk out with the cupcakes. You arrest me and say you stole the cupcakes. You're guilty. We're sending you off to misdemeanor court. That's not what our justice system says. That's not the foundation and the premise of what our justice says. You're innocent until proven guilty. But that's not how it plays out. Anybody that's been through a court system, a court of law, knows it doesn't always play out that, like that. Your local news, social media, will find people already presume guilty. They did it. I know they did it. Even before the person has had trial, has been convicted, has had a jury of their peers listening to the evidence, media sometimes prematurely convicts people. Okay? You don't know this till it affects your family, until your son to your daughter to your husband to your wife is under the threat of law. Until the IRS shows up at your home or your business and starts taking charge over your possession, you don't really feel it. So those of you that never have been anything, this conversation doesn't mean anything to you because you really don't have a firsthand revelation or firsthand experience to those. But those who listen to me and you or a member of your family has been through the court system, you understand what I'm talking about because you've experienced it firsthand that there is a hypocrisy within our democracy when it comes to uh, social justice and equal justice. Not so much about social justice, it's about equal justice under the law. Many poor people and people of color have had their lives turned upside down and destroyed because of the presumption of guilt or lack thereof. And even if there was, if they were proven innocent, they were stained. They were scarred. Because once you have been through that system, it scars you whether you are innocent or guilty. And if you have gone through a system where you were innocent and they charged you and treated you like you're guilty, they don't come back and apologize. They don't come back and say, Hey, we are sorry for putting you and your family through this. Here's a check for us wrongly accusing you of a crime that you did not commit. Our system of justice does not do that. Top lawyers, mouthpiece and other resources have to defend you in the accusations if you're charged. And a higher chance of survival through the justice win or lose has to do with who's representing you. If you can afford a good attorney, you got a higher probability of being set free and
367 people in the United States have been exonerated by DNA testing. That includes 21 people who were sitting on death row at the time of their exoneration through DNA testing. That's bad. I don't care how you look at that. 367 people. You say, well, that's not much out of millions of people in America. Hey, one's too much. Remember what Sir Matthew Hale said, that it was better to let five guilty men go free than to convict one innocent person. This is not that. This is 367 people that were serving time for crimes that they did not commit. And of those 367, 21 of them were headed to death. Hey, I'm Lewis Howard. I appreciate you joining the conversation. We're just kind of breaking down and talking about the hypocrisy in our democracy. 21 states have released inmates at the state level. 12 states had released inmates on the local level uh, because of the DNA testing. 11 states had not released inmate inmates to uh, coronavirus. Two states have published the release of certain inmate population. Four states have temporarily released certain populations or in inmates. This is regarding to COVID. So, so according to COVID, this is how some states are responding. So people are just not responding equally. How can we have a consistency in our law when our local states and cities, they're all over the map. When a 15 year old in Washington is given just, you know, 10 years for the same crime that a 15 year old in Florida is given life for two 15 year old tried as an adult. So our system is is just out of balance in terms of how it is applied in different states. So the hypocrisy of those who are for a well connected, if you're a well connected individual, a lot of this show don't apply to you because if you can hire a good attorney and lawyer, your chances of prevailing in court goes substantially higher than if you are a local economic individual on EBT food stamp section eight. Yeah. Your chances of conviction much higher. And that shouldn't be, we should have equal justice under the law, regardless of what your economic status is, but that's just not the case um, in our judicial system. Here's a few statistics I want to share with you before we go to break. And these are coming from the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics. In 2018, black males accounted for 34 percent of the total male population. White males accounted for 29 percent and Hispanics males count for 24 percent. Many of those people locked up are really locked up for what in many states would be a misdemeanor. But in other states, it's a felony. And so that's an equal uh, unequal justice and unequal application of law that is tearing families apart. Here's the hypocrisy. You can't complain about dads not raising children and not being there when you're locking them up and they're not available to raise their family and to raise their kids. That's a hypocrisy in our democracy. It might look good on the evening news, but it is not good in real life when that really is the reality of how we are treating fathers and they can't be there for their kids and things are happening. We go, oh, well, another kid raised without a father. Yeah, well, he's probably in this statistic that we just looked at crimes that they're locked up for that they should be given second chance for. Or they could be one of those wrongly convicted people that we sort of talked about. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to jump into another part of this segment talking about the hypocrisy of our democracy. I'm Lewis Howard. Stay with me. We'll be right back after these messages. Lewis Howard of Lewis Howard Live has partnered with Amazon Books to bring you his dynamic, life-changing book. From Here to There is the best-selling biopic journey of Lewis Howard's road from adopted child in poverty to achieving over a billion dollars in real estate assets. Lewis shares his secrets and principles, which helped make his meteoric rise to the top an inspiration to millions. Lewis Howard, From Here to There, available on Amazon Books at createspace.com slash 450-6888. Get it today. Hey, this is Lewis Howard. Thank you for staying with us in the conversation. I hope that I've given you some thoughts today that just makes you think a little bit about our system and our justice, not from an angry uh, protest standpoint, but really from a historical, factual basis 
conversation. These are all facts. I'm not making this up. This is not just something that's coming off the top of my head. These are statistics and data that is there for anybody to look at. And so we're talking today about some of the hypocrisy in our democracy. The last thing we talked about, the justice system and its hypocrisy and how it treats people of different colors, economic standing, uh, gender, and so forth, then we're, we have a premise that Lady Justice is blind, but she's not really blind. So that is something that we really have to be better at in America if we're going to be the standard bearer of justice for the rest of the world. The other conversation we'll have is the haves versus the have not. This is a big conversation in America. The haves or the have nots. You either have it or you don't. You either have money, resources, uh, wealth, uh, opportunities, or you don't. People who have little money and few possessions, poor people, usually are, are used in the phrase, the have-nots. That's usually somebody that doesn't have money. You're the have-not. And those that have a higher economic level of influence and money and power, they're the haves, right? I grew up in a have-not category. So I'm a have-not guy. I didn't grow up with a bunch of wealth and money. I mean, we survived but we certainly didn't have uh, plenty of money. I missed some Christmases. I missed some birthdays. Yes, you can send me some extra gifts if you like to make up for my bad childhood. It wasn't really bad, but it wasn't the greatest childhood either. So I grew up in a have-not category. We didn't have everything we need. We, we had to, there was always more month than there was money. You know what I'm talking about? People out there know what that saying means. More month. That means the month came and we still got bills and check is still a few weeks out. So I understand from that perspective. I've been very fortunate later in my life. And you probably today would classify me more in the have category. But I also empathize, relate and connect with people that are have nots. And just because I serve them every day, a part of one of the organizations that I'm partners with, we serve those people that fall into that category. We serve families and individuals that have been homeless, that have been on the street, that have been struggling, that have been fallen and can't get up economically. Uh, they've had to put their dreams on hold. I, I see it every day. So I am acquainted with it. It's not that I've become so disconnected in the class that I live in. I still experience and deal with it every day. <clears throat> and there's a movie called Fences. And if you really want to get a perspective on this, uh, Denzel Washington stars in this movie. And you should go get the movie because it really talks about an African-American family growing up in the 50s and what that have versus have not mentality really is. And I think that was really the crux of really how it came in our industrial age because remember in the 50s we were heavy into factories and production lines and things like that and so you were either a white collar worker or a blue collar worker you either you know had a lot of benefits or you didn't and this movie really talks about that and and you can really see in the 50s and 60s how people really did live and really how it was epitomized and how it still goes on today and so you either have or you don't and social media really promotes this because social media gives more credence to celebrities, people that are rich, wealthy, even if they're in trauma and drama, they put them out there because they have the means, they have the resources, um, they have the public relations, the PR to help them get through what they need to get through. So it, it's really not about trying to educate you on what the have and the have nots is, but it's really talking about, you know, the hypocrisy in our democracy. It's this. They tell you to go to school, work hard and get an education and you'll be successful. Keep your head down and don't say anything stupid and you'll be fine. Get an education. But that's not really true because we got people that have become billionaires that didn't get education. We got people that dropped out of school and didn't get an education and they're rich. Steve Jobs, the late Steve Jobs, founder of Apple. Didn't finish school. Julian Assange, an international man of mystery, right, with, with, with the uh, Wikipedia, right? Didn't get finished college. Bill Gates dropped out of college. Evan Williams, another great individual, dropped out of college. Mark Zuckerberg, that guy that you're probably looking at our show through Facebook, didn't finish college. Larry Ellison, okay? Uh, uh, Jim Coon. These are different, high impactful individuals did not go to school. So the hypocrisy tells you when you tell your kids to scan school because it's a pathway to success, fame, and fortune, it's not necessarily true. And yet we're sitting at a computer 
that was created by the guy that dropped out of college. So we have to watch as leaders, as parents, what message that we are giving our kids. We don't want to be seen as hypocrites telling our kids to do one thing when there's another reality going on, right? That I can become a half without having to go to school. Now, I think you should go to school. I think you should get a good education because it's the foundation to living a good life. So don't misconstrue my message, say, hey, just drop out of school. Don't go back after COVID's over. No, you should still go to school if you have that opportunity to get that education because it puts a framework around your life. But at the same time, if you didn't go to school, don't feel like a failure. You still have great gifts, great talents and great abilities. You can still do something great. History says that you can be an amazing individual. Hey, thanks for joining the show today. Appreciate you having a conversation with us. Uh, we'll be back again. Catch us live on YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you are, we're going to be there. We appreciate you joining and taking time out of your day to tune into the conversation. I'm Lewis Howard Live. Thank you for being part of the conversation. We'll see you again on another show, another program somewhere around the world. Yeah.